Hi, Lily. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. I know you are visiting here just for a trip and yes. I really appreciate you coming on this program. Yeah, you know, you know, it is like this that sometimes you get an offer and your soul tells you yes. And I follow my soul's voice. So that's why I said yes. I'm very interested in your background. Um, I, I know you had a spontaneous awakening. Yes. Uh, and I was curious to hear more about it and how it changed mm. your experience before your awakening mm. and how you experience life now after that happened. Yes, yes. No, I, um, I grew up in a little island on the west coast of Norway. And uh, religion for me was, you know, it was out there. I was not really interested. Uh, I had parents who were very free in their beliefs and I was, I was brought up not in a strict manner. Uh, but I also had the curio curious awakening when I was 16. Um, where I went to a meeting with some very religious people. And um, I was drawn there. I was not interested because I said, no, 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 no. Religion is not interesting for me. But somehow I came and I was sitting there looking around thinking, what do I, what do, I do here? I have nothing here. This is not for me. And then something very strange happened to me. It was like a grief came over me so strong and I did not recognize where it came from. But it was so strong, so forceful that I started to cry. And I couldn't stop myself, I have this enormous emotion. And then the young priest or the speaker, uh, he looked at me and then he started walking towards me. And um, then he put his hand on my shoulder and at that same moment, from his hand, it was like a heat wave went from his hand right into my heart. And I shifted. I shifted from the deepest sorrow, grief, to an ecstatic happiness. And it happens in a second. And I started laughing. And I could just hear him say, thank you, Jesus, for opening her heart. For me, this was like falling in love with Jesus. And uh, I, wa I was like in a bliss. And I was happy, happy, happy. And, uh, but little by little, the people in this sect, in this group, was like, you know, if you wear makeup and if you go on a dance on a Saturday evening and if doomsday come, then you go straight to hell. And for me, this was, what are you talking about? This is wrong. Everything has to do with your heart. What do you feel in your heart? You feel love. What does it matter if I put on false eyelashes? It doesn't matter. So I came to confrontation with the group and I kind of closed the door and saw that religion, everything is manipulation. No, I don't want this. So I was 16 when this happened. I closed the door. And uh, I came to uh, the age of 42, where I experienced success in life, money-wise. I was married, had three beautiful children. Outside, it was like, hmm, this is like a very lucky lady. She had everything, a facade. But inside, I became more and more empty. It was like nothing could, could kind of interest me nothing I wanted to be engaged in. And uh, today I understand that I was very tired, but also that my soul was constantly calling me to change something in my life, and I didn't listen. It was too much noise around me from life. And, um, and then I, got, uh, I went to the doctor, and he uh, told me that I had... Um, a precancerous situation and I needed to take a small operation. Now that was not really scary, but it made me wake up and think that, okay, I have a warning here. This is a signal. I have to do something for myself because two years earlier, my father died of a very innocent 
prostate cancer. So I started, uh, I had never meditated. I was not in the milieu of people interested in, uh, well, in Norway they call it new age. And uh, uh, I, uh, that was not calling me at all. But some friends said, Lily, why don't you take acupuncture treatment? Because it will give you energy and it will help you. Yes. So I uh, booked an appointment with a very, very uh, successful, very well established man, James, and uh, he started to treat me. And he told me after that the first time I was lying on his table, he saw something strange. He saw from my navel a spiral going up. And he knew that I had a force within me which was blocked. And that is why I was becoming sick. So he knew that he had to release this blocking. And he worked with me many weeks, months, and I was as tired as before. I didn't feel nothing happened. So I came a few days before the operation and I said, I will not come back because I don't feel that this is really the treatment for me. I am still tired. I don't feel any change in my body. And uh, he looked at me and he said that, okay, fine. He went out of the room and I could hear him pacing forth and back. And then with secure step, he came right into the room again and he had the needle in his hand and he said, Lily, this is a gold needle and I'm going to do something special with it, just one needle. And I trusted him, so I said, yeah, fine. What is it for? He wouldn't tell me. But he had the type of ceremony where he was blowing at the needle in the four direction. And uh, he was a very like professor type man. So I was watching him, I said, what is he doing? And then he put the needle right under my navel and he started to work it. Didn't feel anything, didn't, um, I was just there. And uh, I was finished, I said goodbye. He wished me the best of luck. I went down to my car and wham, tears was <laughs> sprouting from my eyes. I was crying my heart out. I went home, I still was crying the whole evening. And I said, what did he do to me? Called him the next morning told him and he said fantastic just go on crying it's fine it's fine Lily and uh, I called the hospital to get sure that I had the right time for my operation I'd been waiting for three months and I called the hospital and I said no there is no Lily Bendris here uh, something has happened computer error and then I got scared and I said Wow, I've been waiting three months. My dad was waiting six months and he died. I have to do something. So there were, you know, my understanding is that the universe is weaving our story together. And they put in on the stage exactly what is needed. And you can take the calling or you can avoid it and pass by. But I took the calling because a brochure of a workshop for people with cancer, self-development class, uh, was there by my telephone. It has been there for months. I looked at it and said, no, 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 this is boring. This is not for me. But now it popped up and uh, I called and asked, when do you have your next workshop? And they said, we started one today, one hour ago. And that was the signal for me. And I said, wow. Okay, uh, can I come? Yes, of course. So that was the stepping stone, the start of my new life, because day after day, I experienced strange thing. I closed my eyes and it was like a film was being shown to me. I had these sensations in my body, feeling of meeting with, again, this Jesus, that was on the top of a mountain, should give me a gift. I looked in his hand, 
the hands was empty, there were no gifts, and I was crying my heart out the first day. So everything became very strange. And then the last day, it had lasted for six days, I think. We were sitting in a circle, and the leader of uh, the group, Kaya was her name, she held a stone in her hand and she said that this is a holy stone, this is a talking stone given to me from an old shaman of North America. I visited his tribe and he's dead now, but he gave me this as a gift. And this stone they use in ceremonies so that when you hold it, you will have clear thoughts and open heart. So I want each and one of the group to hold a stone and say, how do you feel it now after the workshop? Something started to happen in my body. It was like a force uh, that started in my feet, worked its way up to my chest. And it was like I had this need of bursting out crying. And my only thought was, Lily, don't don't do anything, keep yourself together, don't create a scene, this is the last day, please, please, because the first day I had been crying my eyes out and everybody else started crying. So now I was desperate to pull myself together. And uh, I didn't want to hold the stone, but she gave it to me. I was holding it and my mind was shattered in chaos there were no words, no clarity at all. So I looked at Kaya and I said, I have no words. And uh, she said, it's okay, Lily. Just give the stone to the next person. I did so. And then the force came even stronger. My heart started to beat like crazy, chest contracted. And Kaya was looking at me and uh, she saw that something very strong was happening. So she said, okay, Lily, don't hold it back anymore. Breathe. And the next thing I remember is that I had no control over my body, my muscles in my face, my head was thrown back, and I found myself in two locations at the same time. I knew I was sitting in a chair in a room in Oslo, Norway. In the same time, I was standing in a desert landscape. In front of me is this old man, uh, wrinkled skin, little fatty hair, one feather hanging down, uh, an old sage, old wisdom keeper. And he was sitting, looking down, just like this, having a pipe in his mouth. There were no sound at all. In front of him was a fire, and from this fire were rings of smoke going up, 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 up to this blue, blue, blue sky. Another picture was this little boy dressed in white, and he was throwing small, like tennis balls up in the air, and they started to spiral as well, going up. They did not fall down again. White eagle was circling on the sky. And then as I am standing in front of him, he speak to me without words, just to my mind. And he say, come closer, I've been waiting for you. And in this film, I uh, walk towards him. And then he opened his hands like this. I did the same and we were walking towards each other and no, I was walking towards him. He was sitting still. So when our fingertips almost met, it was like a lightning charging through my whole body and ending up after running through my body, ending up in the palm of my hands. And it was so physically painful that I came to myself. Uh, back to the room, looking at my hand, screaming, it burns, it burns, it's painful, it burns. So it was actually like somebody had put fire to my hands and in the same time put them on an electrical cord. So 
my hands looked the same. There were no sign of burning. And I said to Kaya, what, what have you done to my hands? It's painful, it hurts, it hurts. And she said, Lily, I have done nothing. It's you. And by these words came this clarity that this was a force that everybody have, but we are not aware of it. It's, it's buried in us. And now it had come to life. It had become activated. And I needed to give this force to somebody. So I remember I was asking if I could put my hands on somebody. And yes, I was allowed to do that. And I ran over to a young lady that had a tumor in her brain. And I remember I put my hands on her, brain, on her head. And it was like, bam, it was pumping out from the palm of my hands. And she almost fainted. And it lasted five minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know. And then there was nothing more. It was empty, nothing. And I remember the, the young lady, she had to lay down on the sofa. Uh, of course, the, 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 the group was, what happened? What happened? But I had this clarity that now I know why I was born. Now I know that I'm not going to die. I have work to do and I have no clue how to do it. But I have to use this power. So I have to learn, I have to read, I have to study. Because this world healing, every, it was strange. I was a businesswoman. I was in the fashion industry, I was running a restaurant. Uh, this was not in my field of interest at all. And of course, having such a strong, powerful experience, it changed my life. It changed my life. I was never the same. I remember I went home that night and told my husband that uh, I have become a healer. Um, <clears throat> he was looking at me and yes. And then he saw that something had happened to me. And I remember the first 14 days, my skin was so sensitive that it almost hurt to touch it. And I had this dreamlike state. I didn't want to be around anybody. I wanted to be alone, close my eyes, and drift into this uh, memory of what I had experienced. And it was such a peace, it was such a fullness. So, um, it took some time for me actually to land and uh, see reality again. And it started there. I started to read books. I started to go to different workshops. And because this had happened to me in a shamanistic way, I was very strongly drawn to shamanism. And I went to the workshop where they were drumming, and when in this guided meditations with the beat of the drum, I traveled out of my body. I, traveled. I had enormous experiences and I felt so protected and so safe. And this old sage, he was with me. He was by my side. And I started to write poems. I started after one year to channel from my throat, changing my appearance becoming this old man with this old voice. And I remember the first time that came true. It was also on a workshop, shamanistic workshop. And the leader of the group, he said, who, who are you and, and, and where are you? Uh, when he heard me talking in this way. And uh, the voice, the spirit said, I am everywhere. I'm part of everything. Uh, and he said, but are you alone? And the answer came, how can I ever be alone when I'm a part of everything? I am in the stream of water. I am in the grass. I am in the tears of a crying child. I'm everywhere. And then came a few years, no, yeah, a few years, where he was walking by my side constantly. 
and I started to work with people that came to me because they heard and um, I started to practice very slowly. And uh, then the next step, and this is what we are going to talk about today. Uh, I was drawn to a meeting with a famous medium called Marina Munk. And they say she's an alien. And uh, she had this fantastic blue eyes and very tall, very thin, and she looked like an alien. She actually lost all of her hair and were bald. So looking at her, it was like, okay, <laughs> they are in her body. Um, I was drawn to her workshop. And uh, there, I don't think it was the first day. I think it was the second day. We should meditate uh, and find our star belonging. Go out of our body and travel. For me, that was never a problem. And I was very excited. I'm, I'm going to find my star. I'm going to find my place. Because when I was a little girl, I was always looking up at the starry heaven and saying, I want to go home, I want to go home. Without really understanding what, what do I want to go home to. And then I journeyed out into space. And I came to this place. And I looked around and I said, but this is planet Earth. This is Earth. And I was very disappointed. I wanted to change my journey, but no, I couldn't. So I was walking like in very, very old time. And I knew I was in Greece. I was like a ghost. Nobody saw me. And I saw people in their everyday uh, work. And then I went into from the streets, packed with people. I went into this open square and there is a pyramidic structure in the middle of the square. Not like the Giza Plateau, it's like a small pyramid. It was white marble and on top of the pyramid there is a woman, long red hair, violet scarf blowing in the wind. Everything was, the material was chiffon like, very delicate and she had this instrument like a bassoon. Is that the right in English? Bassoon? It's like a trumpet. Uh, my English is failing me a bit here now. Um, bassoon, sure. it's like an instrument. You blow music in it. A music instrument. That is one horn, really. But this instrument had four horns. And the lady was blowing in all four of the horns as she was moving in the different directions of the earth. And then above her head, I'm standing in this open square. I'm looking at a lady up there. And above her head is suddenly light, intense light, whirling, swirling, uh, moving. And this huge, huge form comes from thin air. And I hear this vo voice in my whole being saying, I am Andromeda Rex, and I show you your past for you to understand your future. It didn't make sense for me at that moment. I'm just fascinated by looking at the lady. And then in the scenario of this film, let's call it a film, there is a man crawling up the stairs. He is like a king or a general. He has this helmet, this gold helmet, a red cape and naked arms, and he's bleeding. So I understand he comes from the war. He is hurt, he is bleeding, and he's crawling up towards the lady. And she is bending down, holding him in her arms, and the voice comes again, saying, go out, Lily, go out into the battlefield and use your feminine strength to soften the warrior's heart. And that was such a profound, strong message that I logically did not understand at the time. I do now. And then, then the whole scenario disappeared and I came back to myself and I was shaking, ice cold, my teeth were clapping in my mouth 
and I was simply, I was like ice in my body. And uh, we were to share what we had experienced in our journey. And when I shared what I had experienced, uh, Marina came over to me and put her hands on her, my shoulders. And she said, Lily, your true home is the Andromeda galaxy. And you have a blue aura that is always there. It's not your personal aura, it's the aura from Andromeda. And I always see this blue light, which for me is a connection with Andromeda. And uh, she said that you do not need to understand anything. It will come to you if so needed. Just know where your home, where your true home are. And that was the opening. Uh, again, this strong experiences that shake me up bodily, and it's and that in a way helps me to understand this. It is not just an illusion or a hallucination because my body reacts so very strongly. And the journey began, where I started to have experiences of being present in this very, very strange place where it was first like I was sitting around the table with many different beings looking very different, some of them very like us. And I was always shown this man that looks like, like a human. Of course, it can be like they show me what I need to see. I, I understand that. They maybe look like an insect, but I have never seen insect-like people or reptiles or that type of thing. Not either the small, you know, with the big yes. heads. The beings I see is very, very tall, very thin, and are very refined, beautiful. And I, I know that when I saw the... the Lord of the Rings, and I saw the Alf, this lady, said, she looks like them, she looks like them. They're very slanted eyes and, and heart form shape uh, in their face, not a small mouth, but, but more like mine, maybe. And, but it's absolutely a form that is slanted, Asiatic-like of words. And, and the thing, we always communicate telepathically. And uh, there is a form of balance and constant harmony for my eye. Very thin, very tall, like over two meter tall. And there is grace, and they're very graceful. Their movement are very balanced. And they do not speak with their mouths, as I can see everything happen like telepathically. Mm -hmm. And um, and they are showing me different environment. Uh, are your encounters mostly through astral projection or do you have actual physical? No, I have I have no physical. Everything is is happening um, like in a dream state, but in an awakened state in the same time, through meditation. I go into meditation and it is like I move very fast through a tunnel, mm -hmm. multicolored tunnel, very much colors of red, orangey, blue, violet, and it uh, moves. It's like I'm inside a little pearl and this pearl moves through this tunnel. It's very strange. But you are fully awake? Yes, fully awake, fully awake. And then I come to this place and I, um, the first time actually, when I moved in this way, um, this man, as, as the tunnel has its, well, I moved through the tunnel. It is like the little pearl that I'm sleeping in is opening, falling to pieces or a door is opening and I'm standing in this room, which is also in, when you see a pearl have this very beautiful luster and very, very creamy rose color, 
this is the environment I come into, this room where everything is like very naked and uh, the man is standing in front of me and he looks exactly like a man from planet Earth. And he have this tattoo on his shoulder and he have like a long, like a long, uh, like a Roman attire almost. And he's talking to me. And in this naked room, it's like a, a table is coming up from the floor. Everything is rounded shape. There are no rectangles. Everything is rounded. And then he do like that with his hand and the wall changes. And there is a map of planet Earth. And on that map, he shows me small red flags. And he say, this is the power places of planet Earth. This is meeting places, stargates, power places that when time comes will become activated and the earth will shift and there will be a new alignment because where you see them now, they are quite out of its focal point, but it was made that way. And there are thousands of thousands of star people around the planet that will hear the calling, will go to these places to activate them through themselves, like they are acupuncture needles. What, what are these stargates? Stargates is passages. It's, it's, it's a way to go into higher dimensions from planet Earth, not through your physical body, but through, you can call it your energy body, your energy body, because you, it's everything through your consciousness, but still your consciousness can be like this and when you are when you are accessing a stargate your consciousness kind of wow explodes it gives you it is an antenna in a way and the stargates is also inside every atom of your body so you journey internally but he is explaining this to me and i have this feeling that he say there will be many centers built and I have this feeling that he's asking me to build a center on the mountain. And I said, no, 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 don't ask me to do that. I belong high heels on, on the street. I'm not going to any mountain. So the whole thing was very interesting. But that was kind of the first meeting, giving me a kind of information, kind of instructions but everything under my free will. But where are these targets? The one I saw was very strongly in, in Marbella, Spain. He showed me specifically there, the Bermuda Triangle, yes, but there is a, there is a ley line from the mountains of Spain uh, down through uh, the Atlantic Ocean to Bermuda Triangle. And he showed me around the street of Gibraltar. And it's interesting because when he's talking about Atlantis, the, um, the gates of Hercules, it's between Morocco and Gibraltar. And there is a lot of UFO sightings there. And I had a lot of experiences there with meetings. And that was physical I saw, which, which came and showed themselves. So he kind of pinpointed this on the mount mountain around that area because it was the meaning at that time I should move down there, so locally. But if it is necessary, I know that I can any time go in, if it is necessary, to also find the stargates in Norway, because we have many there. There are 12 major stargates, and then they have corridors and lesser stargates. It's all over the planet. It's all over the planet. Some of them are ve very well known, like Stonehenge in England, the, the pyramidic structures of Giza. And, and the interesting thing, not shown to me that time, this becoming my lo the last six years, I started to speak something called language of light. It's a star language. And, um, and when I opened up for that, it was like, 
what am I, what am I talking about? But it was very strongly energetically emotional when I open up to it. And uh, I speak it now very often when I have my speeches and workshops and things. And, um, and there are many, many languages. This is something new that this, you can Google it. And it's like a, 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 a epidemic that is, uh, that is happening. People start, in my workshop, people start to speak their own language. So this is fascinating in itself. But what my beings told me about the light language and the stargates and the pyramidic structure is that when you come to certain frequency, when enough people come to certain frequency uh, through their spiritual work, through their meditation, through their language, the pyramid will start speaking to you all over the world. You will act as acupuncture needles for, for the, the pyramidic structures. And in the coming years, you will find a lot of hidden pyramids that is deeply buried under the sand in Egypt. And it has been found a lot of pyramid under the oceans. So he said, then they will start to sing to you. And they will also open and shift uh, the, the tip of the, of the, of the, of the planet. Planet consciousness. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and the pyramid in Bosnia is very interesting regarding that. Because there is a sound emitting from the top of the pyramid. They don't know, they do not have a clue from where the sound comes. And they are studying and they're coming from all over the world to study it. So something is going on. And for me, it is absolutely not an invasion, as we think that these horrible films that are coming to eat us and take over the planet. No, if they should do that, that would have come like 300 years ago. And um, but th this is the polarity playing itself out. My experience is that the benign being that I am in contact with, they, they are like our older brothers and sisters, and they have accepted the roles as the big brother and sister, but they also send soul particles of themselves into human bodies. So at a certain point, when your frequency is raised sufficiently, you will have an awakening. And I think that was what happened to me, the abrupt awakening, where my junk DNA suddenly started to, to sing to me, started to show me images, started to lead me into and traveling through many different dimensions, through many different worlds. And that has been an ongoing process ever since. Were you able to ever travel to the ship? A lot of people speak about Yeah. I feel that I travel to certain artificial planets uh, which are very... Uh, it is like it is... The planet itself is rock and brown stones. But then there are energy... Uh, there is energy... Oh, what's the English word? Energy like roof. Huge, huge, huge. And inside is this beautiful cities, beautiful art, but everything is very different. And uh, all the time I see uh, the, the shapes are very rounded, very soft. And for example, if I lean towards the wall in a house, the walls is like a cushion. It, it kind of forms around me. It's like a jelly type of substance that's Ah, uh, yeah, and it is like the houses itself have consciousness. Everything is alive. Uh, the flowers is alive, and and the beings again. There are not many people. It's it's like enough room, and um, and uh, it is like universities and places I'm taken to that is not maybe really a world in itself, but it's constructed places. 
And the ship, yes, I have been inside a huge ship. I can say like <laughs> Las Vegas is huge, it's huge. And it would take days to, to walk through it. But the interesting thing is that it's a replica. I see trees, flowers. It's like I see a replica of planet Earth. It's an environment that is exactly like here. And I think it is created. And they have taken samples from planet Earth and created the environment, everything that is needed, like artificial sun, everything that is needed to recreate our environment. But it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And there are music, sounds with changes. And it is like I may hear one song, my neighbor may hear another one. It's like it goes directly into my, my, my uh, system. And color changes. And I was shown, like in the middle of this ship, in this construction, it's like a huge, it was like a waterfall of colors and energy structures, which were alive, like beautiful, beautiful, like the rainbow, huge. And they say, this is the essence of the ship. There is the power, but it's not power as you know it. It is a different kind of power, but it powers the ship. And everything goes through the, our consciousness. We create and recreate through our consciousness. And our world, even if it do not seem very dynamic for you, is very dynamic. We create all the time. Everything is about creating and uh, changing and, and a constant movement of creation. It's, it's not still. Uh, a house may be changed and um, and it was like amazing. And I said, how is the government? How is the government? And they say, well, to explain it so that you can understand it. Let's say there is a huge computer which is tuned into every, 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 every person. And when, it, when every person is locked in and tuned into that, when a question is asked, the person, through the free will, answers. For example, if we would have an election, you're talking about democracy. If we would have an election, we will simply then, the computer will tune in to every person in our environment. And you cannot lie. You talk your truth and you feed that into the computer. And a decision is made out from who is uh, the most votes, but it's no fake votes, it's the truth. And it is, the answer is not from personal gain. Oh, I will vote for this party because I pay less taxes. It is, it is a unique society of unity. And in the same time, every person is unique and honored in his own way. So for me, this is like, it's a recipe of a perfect world. How is it possible? And I say, but how did you come to this conclusion? How did you pass all the wars? And they say that we shifted our focus through stim stimuli in our brain so that you know when you, um, when you drink champagne, you are happy. And when you have stimuli, you're happy. But they started to resonate that they wanted to adapt into happiness instead of, of hate, instead of quarrel they wanted. They decided, because they saw that their civilization would end if they were going on with a strong polarity. So they have done the job before us. They have the blueprint. And what they say now is that we are, through our intervention, by being, sending part of ourselves into a human being. You are, you are a human being, Lily, but you're part alien. And we, we start to recreate the blueprint 
we awaken our blueprint because we have done it, we have mastered it. But you cannot do it in one moment like that. It is a process and it's live or die. And there will be world that absolutely uh, are in the beginning of their evolution having a lot of polarity. But I say that we are seeded from many different star systems and that the planet Earth was a great experiment. But we needed to be left alone to see the infrastructure that we would create. And uh, we rise to fabulous uh, entrepreneurs, uh, to become fabulous entrepreneurs, uh, and entrepreneurs. Oh, sorry for my English. And, uh, and then you fell down again and you have the, the kind of, of understanding of the fall of Atlantis. This is mythical stories and in the same time, everything is an illusion, everything is stories, but we live after the story and we adapt to the stories of our past and what do we want to become our future. So the most important for me is the subtle thing that happens, that they come to us and they start to help us to change by activating their own blueprint. So suddenly, a lie, which was easy to say uh, in the old world, will become more difficult because, no, I cannot say that. I cannot hate that person. Yeah, I would have a reason to hate him, but I cannot do that because a new blueprint starts to be invoked in us. And this is the key. Every person's uniqueness start to change. That's why they stress we will come, we will not come as a mass invasion. We will come so that you start to align and believe that there is a future. You will start to believe that the universe has life, intelligence, that you are a multidimensional being and that you live in the future as you live now. And you will start to communicate with your many selves in the many time frames and worlds and dimensions. And based on what's going on in our world right now, uh, what, what, what do they say? What, what do they think that which direction we are going? Yes, this is, this is like the end time of Atlantis. This is the great test. And they say that they will do everything in their power to help us choose love, choose balance. And in order for us to make that choice, we need to make visible everything that has been cooking under the surface. So what you see now is the result of things becoming visible. It has been there all the time, but hidden. No, it cannot be hidden anymore, and it explodes. And it needs to explode in a way. But they will, they say that, remember, that there is a wave of hate and you have to be the, the wave of love like a tsunami and you have to meet the wave of hate and intermingle with it, intermingle with it. You cannot destroy it, but you intermingle with it and like the million, billion drops of water, when they start to intermingle, they take something from each other and then we are helped a lot of old souls, a lot of star seeds, beautiful children being born now that are so empathic, they're so wise. My little grandchild, he, he is like, how can, how can people be, be, be um, mad at each other? That is not good. And they say things that you look at them and say, where does this wisdom come from? And their eyes. So, so babies are being born now that brings a lot of memory. So let's say there were three generations. It started with the first generations that came, struggled, couldn't talk at a distance. Then the next generation, a little bit better. And the third generation, then it will be the result. So let's say I'm a middle generation. I was walking a bit and paving the, the, the part for those that comes after. So you have beautiful young uh, kids now and um, and you can see that when I saw the film E.T., the, the, this little creature, ugly, but so charming, so beautiful, I said, yes, yes. 
And I, I remember in one of my meditations, I'm traveling again, and I see this being in front of me looking almost like a reptile with his yellow eyes, with a strike. And, and I'm kind of, okay, who are you? And he looks at me and telepathically, he said, look into my eyes. And I think I've never seen so much love in anybody's eyes. And he say that the different forms are sacred. Nature develop unique forms. And you, you are being trained now. Look what is happening uh, to the children who are different. The handicapped children, the children that you, like two generations ago, they were set out to die in the, in the, in the primitive country and they were hidden behind closed doors. No, you integrate them, you take them out, you look at them, you see their value. So an ET was such a creature that made the children look at this little guy feeling love, not fear. It's the children now see their toys and you have the Star Wars and you see these different beings. So they learn to kind of look at different shapes and forms and it doesn't mean that it is evil if it has a form that is very strange and different from, from us. They say that you, you need to learn to interact with your heart and your gut feeling, not through form, not what is shown to you. That's an important lesson. And this is a moment for us for a transformation. Yes. Like yes. Each, each individual is equally important. Some of us have taken the job of talking about it, but there are those that don't even know what is happening, but things start to awaken in them and they start to have dreams, they start to have experiences, they start to feel t um, the heat in their hands, healing, telepathy, and it, it's a great awakening movement. Uh, back to Andromedans, uh, what is their everyday life like? What do they do on a day to day? They are, they are living very much like us, but let's say that if you take 200 years into the future, there is, they do not till the earth. They, uh, it's like very advanced where it is not so much work with their body, it's very much creating thing with their mind. And, um, and it is very much uh, creating art, beauty, and technology, uh, going to new star systems, traveling through space. And I'll, anyhow, I find that um, they are together in a way that is not exactly like couples here on planet Earth. It is more like soul contracts that they are together. It's great love between them. And, um, and in the physical contact, uh, like having sex here, they say it's different here. We, we have our orgasm <laughs> through like our body, through our mind. We do, we, they are less physical. I feel that they are less physical. And, um, and that, that is okay. It's, uh, when I am there, I do not see them hug each other so much, but they touch, they touch in this way. And they look, and you can see their aura flaring up. It's beauty, it's like, you know you can have a meditation and you feel such a bliss. Uh, and, and it is this emotion which is really an advancement of our physical. We have very strong physical bodies, very uh, dense. So we need more physical expression. We are not capable of having those feelings. But they have advanced and they are much more in their creative status of mind to control also their emotions. What are uh, the emotions in their world? In our, we have so many different emotions. Yes, here. they are quite, quite, 
curious about our anger and our state. They do not have anger. I have not seen any of them angry uh, or hateful or vengeful. It is like, it's like uh, the Buddha. They smile and they laugh and they have humor, but it's, it's su such a balance. It's such a balance. I feel that I am very emotionally unstable compared to them. And they also say to me, you may maybe would find always boring because you do not have the capacity yet to feel as intensely as we feel. But we do not have this outward expression as much. It's very much an inward uh, feeling. Were there any new feelings you were exposed to or new senses? Safety. Safety, grace, balance, being, being taken care of, being part of a group, unity. That's very sounds strong. Like an illusion. Sounds like an illusion. And it's so hard to achieve here on planet Earth. Were yeah. there any technologies you um, got to? Information yes, it was this, they call it the computer system that take care of most of the things. But also, uh, some of this world, some of these places are so highly advanced that they don't even need a body. It's everything, it's, it's not, they can create the body uh, or they can be just energy, uh, energy. But this is highly, highly um, advanced beings. And they say, we do not need a UFO, we do not need uh, we do not need steel or any type of, uh, of form. We create our light body and with other light bodies, we create a ship and we travel through our consciousness. There is no speed of light. It is in a moment you call us, in a moment you think about us, we are within the same room. So when you dream, I dream, oh, I'm going to Hawaii. I find myself in Hawaii. It's a dream. So it's, you can liken it to that that they listen. There are those that are connected to them. It is like a constant reply uh, when you feel that you need to connect. And many times I have seen the shapes on the heaven like clouds that has come when I ask for proof. And they said to me that it was us but we use the humidity in the air to create this cloud with these colors to give you a kind of sighting. Okay, if you would be up in this cloud, it would be a cloud because our frequency are so much higher. But we can create holograms, we can create so that you have a visual, so that you can see. Because we need a visual. Right? We need a visual, yes. And don't forget that there are races that are much more dense than the beings that I am in contact with. They're much more dense. And they, they have, I mean, it's billions of planets out there. Come on. And, but what I feel is that there is an agenda, it's a cosmic agenda, um, that are protectors for worlds. Uh, and they create like an energy field that help us from harm, okay? And this energy field is hold, held in place so that uh, when they say that these low dense, uh, uh, ugly beings, machines come and take us, no, they cannot go through this field. They cannot, they are too dense, they are too primitive. Because this, these beings, they can change things like that. They don't need any other thing. They can change, they can erase, because they master the world of illusion. They master the world of illusion. So like when you see somebody playing a trick, it's an illusion. Your mind's eye, they master it. They they, they say that, okay, our reality is a computer program. It's, uh, it's like matrix in a way, but it is created by love. It is not to diminish us. It is genuine. When you have a child, you do the 
you want the best for your child. We are somehow their children. So they're looking after us. But they say, but you have to learn on your own accord. We, can, we cannot live life for you. We cannot come and save you. But we can help you to take choices that is good for you, that is wise for you. And we can help you remember that you're more than what you are. Do they talk about any other star systems or... Um, oh, there are many, 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 many. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Many systems. I, I haven't been interested really to dive in and check because I, for many years, needed to meet other people that believed the same as me to feel that I was not crazy. And when I had enough sightings and enough journeys, I just say, okay, it's enough. I know now, so let me go out and work. So when I started uh, my television program in Norway, it was with something completely different. Haunted houses, solving of murder cases. I mean, completely different. And I said, am I going to do this? But I have been on television for 15 years. And what is interesting is that they say, it's a plan here. Because you have created a certain platform. So when you come and talk about these crazy things, Maybe people will listen. Maybe people will listen because you are who you are. And um, so there's always a plan. There's always a plan. One question I wanted to ask about Andromedans. Uh, I know they are not that tied to physical form, but have you noticed any kind of like aging process? In no, America? no, there is no aging process. It's like they can live on forever. It's that they, they can change their form. So they look like they are in their 30s. No, I see no elder people there. And there is no concept of death? Not as I understand it. They say we, we can switch our consciousness to experience something else. We can move from our world because we want to experience something else. But they know that they're not disappearing. They're simply changing their focus. And how, where, how close do you think we are with making a contact with them? Oh, I think many people have contact already. I think millions of people have contact, but they have mostly the contact in dream state. And, and uh, quite a few also have had physical sightings, um, have a type of experience that would receive their inner eye. Uh, and have such strong emotions and feelings around it that I know that this is not just a hallucination, not a dream. So they are called upon, they are awakened. So I think that many, many more have met them than we are aware of. I remember I just, I went to the north of Norway having a conference where I was going to speak, not about Andromedans at all. I was going to speak about ghosts. And, um, and then when I come to the platform, they say, no, you're not going to speak about what you think you're going to speak about. You're going to speak about Andromedans and what is happening. And I'm doing so. And when I was finished, this old Sami lady came over to me and she said, I traveled 40 uh, miles. I don't know, it's kilometer is different than your miles here, but it was like six hour drive with 12 dogs in my little bus because I was told by my star friends that I needed to listen to you and that they would, they would tell things that I needed to hear. I'm living alone out in nowhere with reindeer and at night, they visit me. I see them, I communicate with them, and I have thought I was crazy. So they said, no, you need, you need to meet this lady. So she came this long way, and she was crying, and she said, thank you. And it was all orchestrated from them. Is, is there any message you would like to share with the audience today? Yes. The message is that dare to believe that you are more than this body sitting here. Dare to believe that you are a powerful being and that you can change something that is not good in your life and for the better good as well. Believe 
in your thoughts and in your ability to be a God being in yourself. You are masterful, you are beautiful, and uh, rise up above all quarrel and stand strong and tall because there are friends out there that wants to dance with you, walk with you, listen to you, inspire you, and so let you be a speaker as well. Be dare to talk about your thing. It's okay to be skeptical, but dare to believe that there is something more, that something bigger, and that we are actually about to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. I greatly appreciate your time, and I think you have been more than generous to do this. You know, there is, I mean, I would speak in for three hours. I've just taken a little bit, but okay. It is a little bit. And it's, it's really an honor to meet you in person and have this beautiful talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, to find out more about Lily, please go to lilybenhees.com and please leave your comments and feedback. Uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.